hello again. Welcome to the Cory Doctor O podcast, and welcome once again to my parents' basement. I'm here on holidays in Toronto with the family, having come to Canada to go to the World Science Fiction Convention, where uh, I lost two Hugos, one uh, Prometheus Award and a Golden Duck Award, and had a, a smashing time, except for Alice coming down with strep throat on the train on the way from Toronto to Montreal and spending the entire time throwing up. But apart from that, it was smashing. It was lovely to see all those people I saw and have a nice time. Uh, The holiday is good, not as restful as I'd like it to be. A lot of running around, seeing family, uh, a lot less relaxing, going to movies and kind of chilling with the baby than I'd like. But we've gotten a fair bit of the latter done, and that's been very good. And... um, This is going to be a very short podcast because I'm just stealing a couple of minutes while Alice takes care of the kid. Uh, There's something else I wanted to mention to you. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of interesting to be coming to the end of this book uh, in the reading. And as I I look at the scroll bar on my my reading copy here, it's nearly at the bottom. And coming to the end of For the Win, the novel that I started writing in January, which is almost finally almost done. The the ending has been Zeno's Arrow, just getting closer and closer with it, ever reaching it. And I'm really turning a corner here and, you know, just a few days away. It's one of the reasons that this holiday hasn't been very restful is this Damoclean sword, this light book hanging over my head. I don't like being light. Uh, So, that's the story, Morning Glory, and here is a little more, just one or two more scenes from Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town. The back alleys of Kensington were a maze of coach houses, fences, dead ends, and narrow doorways. Kids who knew their secrets played ball hockey nearly undisturbed by cars, junkies turned them into reeking pissoirs, homeless people dossed down in the lees of their low, crazy-angled buildings, teenagers came and necked around corners. But Alan knew their secrets. He'd seen the aerial maps, and he'd clambered their length and breadth and height with Kurt, checking sight lines for his network, sticking virtual pushpins into the map on his screen, where he thought he would get some real benefit out of an access point. So once he reached Kensington Avenue, he slipped behind a Guyanese paddy stand and stepped through a wooden gate and began to make his way to the back of Kurt's place, cautiously. From behind, the riot of colors and the ramshackle signs and subculture of Kensington was revealed as a superface, a skin stretched over slightly daggy brick two stories with tiny yards and tumble-down garages. From behind, he could be walking the back ways of any anonymous housing development, a no-personality gray zone of nothing and no one. The sun went behind a cloud and the whole scene turned into something monochromatic, a black-and-white clip from an old home movie. Carefully, he proceeded. Carefully, slipping from doorway to doorway, slipping up the alleyway to the next, to the corner that led to the alley that led to Kurt's, carefully listening watching. And he managed to sneak up on Krishna and Davy, and he knew that for once he'd be in the position to throw the rocks. Krishna sat with his back against the cinder block wall near Kurt's back door, knees and hands splayed, head down in a posture of supplication. He had an unlit cigarette in his mouth, which he nervously shifted from corner to corner like a soggy toothpick. Behind him, standing atop the dented and scabrous garbage cans, was Dumont. He rested his head on his folded arms, which he rested on the sill, and he stood on tiptoe to see in the window. I'm hungry, Krishna said. I want to get some food. Can I go get some food and come back? Quiet, Duane said. Not another fucking word, you sack of shit. He said it quietly, in a neutral tone that was belied by his words. He settled his head back on his folded forearms like a babe setting its head in a bosom, and he looked back through the window. Ah, he said, like he'd taken a drink. Krishna climbed slowly to his feet and stood off a pace or two, staring at Drew. He reached into the pocket of his old bomber jacket and found a lighter and flicked it nervously a couple of times. Don't you light that cigarette, Davy said. Don't you dare. How long are you going to be here? Krishna's wine was utterly devoid of his customary swagger. What kind of person is he, David said. What kind of person is he? He is in love with my brother, looks at him with cow eyes when he sees him, hangs on his words like a love-struck girl. He laughed nastily, (laughs) like your love-struck girl, and she looks at him. I wonder if he's had her yet. 
Do you think he has? I don't care, Krishna said petulantly, and levered himself to his feet. He began to pace, and Alan hastily backed himself into the doorway he'd been hiding in. She's mine, no matter who she's fucking. I own her. Look at that, Daryl said. Look at him talking to them, his little army, like a general, giving them a pep talk. He got that from my brother, I'm sure. Everywhere he goes, he leaves a trail of manipulators who run other people's lives. Alan's stomach clenched in on itself, and his butt and thighs ached suddenly like he'd been running hard. He thought about his protégés with their shops and their young employees, learning the trade from them as he learned it from him. How long had Dawn been watching him? When are we going to do it? Krishna spat out his cigarette and shook another out of his pack and stuck it in his mouth. Don't light it, Drew said. We're going to do it when I say it's time to do it. You have to watch first. Watching is the most important part. It's how you find out what's needs doing and to whom. It's how you find out where you can do the most damage. I know what needs doing, Krishna said. We can just go in there and trash the place and fuck him up. That'd suit me just fine. Send the right message, too. Danny hopped down off the trash can abruptly, and Krishna froze in his paces at the dry rasp of hard, blackened skin on the pavement. Davy walked toward him in a bow-legged, splay-hipped gait that was more a scuttle than a walk, the motion of some inhuman creature not accustomed to two legs. Have you ever watched your kind, ever? Do you understand them even a little? Just because you managed to get a little power over one of my people, you think you understand it all. You don't. That one in there is bone loyal to my brother. If you vandalized his little shop, he'd just go to my brother for protection and end up more loyal and more. Please stop thinking you know anything. It'll make it much easier for us to get along. Krishna stiffened. I know things, he said. Your pathetic little birdie girl is nothing, Davy said. He stumped over to Krishna, stood almost on his toes, looking up at him. Krishna took an involuntary step backwards. A little one-off, a changeling without clan or magic of any kind. Krishna stuck his bald fists into the pockets of his space-age future sarcastic jacket. I know something about you, he said, about your kind. Oh, yes? Davy's tone was low and dangerous. I know how to recognize you, even when you're passing for normal. I know how to spot you in a crowd in a second, he smiled. Been watching your kind all your life. You've been watching my kind all your life, but I've been watching your kind for all of mine. I've seen you on the subway and running corner stores, teaching in classrooms and driving to work. Davy smiled then, showing blackened stumps. Yes, you can, you certainly can. He reached out one small, delicate hand and stroked the inside of Krishna's wrist. You're very clever that way, you are. Krishna closed his eyes and breathed heavily through his nose, as though in pain or ecstasy. That's a good skill to have. They stood there for a moment while Davy slowly trailed his fingertips over Krishna's wrist. Then, abruptly, he grabbed Krishna's thumb and wrenched it far back. Krishna dropped abruptly to his knees, squeaking in pain. You can spot my kind, but you know nothing about us. You are nothing. Do you understand me? Krishna nodded slowly. Alan felt a sympathetic ache in his thumb and a sympathetic grin on his face at the sight of Krishna knelt down and made to acquiesce. Do you understand me? Krishna nodded again. Davy released him, and he climbed slowly to his feet. Davy took his wrist again, gently. Let's get you something to eat, he said. Before Alan knew it, they were nearly on him, walking back down the alley, straight toward his hiding place. Blood roared in his ears, and he pressed his back up against the doorway. They were only a step or two away, and after a couple of indiscreetly loud, panting gasps, he clamped his lips shut and held his breath. There was no way they could miss him. He pressed his back harder against the door, and it abruptly swung open, and a cold hand wrapped itself around his bicep and pulled him through into a darkened, oil and must smelling garage. He tripped over his own heel and started to go over, but a pair of hands caught him and settled him gently on the floor. Quiet, came a hoarse whisper in a voice he could not place. And then he knew who his rescuer was. He stood up silently and gave Billy a long hug. He was skinny as death. All right, then. 
Talk to you next week when I'm back in London. You've been listening to the Cory Doctor Podcast, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, share-alike US 3.0. Or as Woody Guthrie put it in another context, this song is copyrighted in the US under seal of copyright 154085 for a period of 28 years, and anyone caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend of ours, because we don't give a dern. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it, we wrote it, that's all we wanted to do. Many thanks to John Taylor Williams for mastering. That's Rynex Studio, W-R-Y-N-E-C-K Studio at gmail.com. John Taylor Williams is a full-time self-employed audio engineer, producer, composer, and sound designer. In his free time, he makes beer, jewelry, odd musical instruments, and furniture. He likes to meditate, to read, and to cook. Talk to you next week.